Hello and welcome back to the third and final video in this series on database cluster upgrades using PostgreSQL with a zero or thereabouts amount of downtime. Now I'm not sure how long this video is going to be because actually there aren't many things that we sort of type, there aren't many operations to do. Most of what we do is in sort of the planning and thinking about what we can do in parallel and at what point something's going to change and therefore we just need to be careful that we've got a fail back plan. Now just by way of introduction I've set up a test cluster on my local machine in VirtualBox uh, and it kind of looks like this so we've got PG admin which is a Postgres tool sort of a GUI for Postgres and that's pointing to the old cluster which is Postgres 123 servers and the new cluster Postgres 11, 12 and 13. So they're all running version 15 and these three are all running version 14. And if I go here, I've got two kind of PowerShell windows. The first are the three old cluster servers and also Barman, which is where the backups are taken. And then these three are the three new servers. Now, like I say, this isn't a video about setting up replication and configuring Postgres, so I'm not really going to talk about how I've set these things up, except just to remind you that I've created an SSH connection between Postgres 11 and Postgres 1, because Postgres 11 will be copying files from Postgres 1 across to set up the schema for our test database. So that's all set up with public keys, so I don't need any passwords and stuff like that. And just in terms of good practice for the cluster itself, because we're using Rep Manager and Barman, like I usually do, then all of these machines in the cluster can talk to each other, and these three can talk to each other as well, again, using SSH. So most of that stuff's already set up. If we look in Barman, um, I usually log in as the Barman user interactively just so that we don't need to sudo everything. And if I do barman check Postgres 1, that's set up for the old cluster. So I've taken a backup already and they're all green, which is good. And Postgres 11, taking a backup on that as well, which is also good. So they're all good and ready to go. I'm using the same barman server for the old and the new cluster. It's, there's not really a lot in it. In this case, it's obviously easier just to have one server instead of two. Um, but if you were using, you know, shared storage, that might make it easier or harder to have two separate um, Barman servers. That's up to you. But effectively, it's just a normal kind of cluster. And then what I have here on Postgres 1, the old primary, I have a single relevant database called Test Database. And it just has a couple of tables in it called companies and contacts. And I filled those with some um, synthetic data from getsynth.com. Thanks, guys. That's just to kind of show how we're going to copy data across. And then what I've done here on the new primary is created a database, but there's nothing in it. So literally right click, create database, give it the name test database. Uh, which you have to do before you load a schema into it. So the schema doesn't create the database, it just loads a schema. And because these are all replicas, these will have a copy of the test database with the data in it. And these two will have copies of the test database on the new cluster that is empty because we haven't loaded a schema in it. So that's kind of where we are. We're going to do some stuff in the GUI. It's a little bit easier. And we'll do some stuff on the command line as well. So what is the plan? Again, reminder, 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 most of the work is the planning. It's not about the individual things we're gonna type in now. It's about considering your sort of risk appetite, working out what apps you're gonna to need to upgrade, how you're gonna upgrade them, what order you're gonna upgrade them in. Um, is it easy enough to do them all in parallel? Uh, are different people gonna migrate different databases? Is it going to be done out of hours? All of those sorts of questions, which will be very specific to what your business is doing, is just all to do with the planning. Then what we're going to do is we're going to enable logical log level on the old primary. And that is because in order for logical replication to work, we need the log information to include logical data, not just physical data. And so we'll need to do that first. 
will then I've already created a new empty database which I showed you in the test cluster but we'll need to dump the schema from the old database and then load that into the new one so it has the same tables and views and everything else and then once that's ready to go we create a publication on the old server so that's effectively the announcement of a logical replica and then the subscription is the new server which is going to subscribe to the publication and when that subscription is created it will initiate a copy of all of the data that's already in the table and then from that point onwards any changes that are applied to the old one will get synchronized via logical replication to the new one and then that could be done you know in advance none of those things are breaking at that point and as long as we're not writing to our new database it will just stay in sync with the old one have all the same column data and everything else so we can use that for testing um, testing our app works on the new version um, test certain bits of functionality just make sure it's playing nice depending on how mission critical it is we might set up monitoring on it we might want to run some kind of performance tests on it is it working as good as the older version or is there a performance problem is there a parameter i forgot to set um, did i accidentally choose two gig of ram instead of eight gig of ram and all those sorts of things so there's obviously different things you can do at that point just to test it all but at the point you're then ready to switch over you within re usually quite short succession we reseed the sequences which we'll look at uh, in a little bit and then once those are reseeded we're in a position to switch over and if you've done everything right that switch over should be fairly low drama it should just work it should be nice and quick but obviously always with the option that if that switch over itself causes something bad to happen we've suddenly gone oh no uh, we get to switch back at which point then the, the new database is probably now defunct we need to either um, keep the replication running or we might need to wipe it all and start again if we've miss, missed something more important than that and then eventually we'll tidy up the, the old stuff um, obviously we don't really need to demo that part of it but so one of the first things we need to do is we need to enable logical while level now one of the things that's a bit annoying about this is it requires a restart of the server and this is the primary so at some point we are going to um, being a bit lazy here if you just type it in um, we're going to need to restart the primary and whether we do it during a failover um, again we're just going to have to probably have to do it when there's low traffic so that we don't risk losing too much data or anything or losing availability at that point so effectively in the postgresql.conf file for our version so this is the old database here control w in nano for where is uh, and the parameter is called well level well is just write ahead logs so rather than logging after you've done something you log before you've done it so that if the operation itself fails or the server restarts or you know whatever you've always got the logs that are ahead of the operation so you can ap apply the log again and uh, make sure that you haven't lost any data so that's why they call well and you see by default everything if it's commented out like it is here with the hash symbol the pound symbol is that value written here is the default so defaults to replica obviously if you did that it would still be replica but we need to set that to logical so all we do is change it to logical control x yes save and like i say unfortunately sudo service postgresql uh, restart obviously this is a small server running a small database so the restart isn't particularly slow um, there are also if you're running multiple versions of postgresql there are separate service names i think it's you know something like that um, could be more specific to the version 14 one than the version 15 but can't remember exactly so we restarted that so now at this point any logs that are being created obviously there aren't any because this is a test database and i'm not writing to it at the moment but any new logs that are created are going to have the logical data there now one thing i tend to do um i'm not 100 percent sure and it's necessary it probably isn't but i think it's good practice is now that you've made that change to the log file i will just go in here and i'll run barman backup postgres one and then what i'm going to get there is effectively a full base backup a checkpoint of the database and then in my head from that point on i've got all of the information i need in order to create that replica to the secondary 
I think it probably would work anyway. I suspect that it doesn't use um, the log files for that initial table copy, but, um, but I don't really know, so that seems fine. Um, so I've got, a I've got a backup now, so that's done and the log level's done. Uh, and so the next thing that we need to do is we need to do this PG dump um, thing. So PG dump is just a command line tool. And this is to basically say, can you give me a SQL file containing the schema for the database that I'm trying to copy? So like I say in here, we created a test database, but if I open that and look down in schemas and in tables, there's nothing there because it's just an empty database. So we want to copy that from here. We could do it in um, PG admin probably, but um, yeah, the, the GUI is a little bit clunky, unfortunately. So sometimes these things are easier to do in here. So um, PG underscore dump is the command line. All of the tools pretty much start with PG underscore, which is nice. Dash dash schema only. I don't want the data. We'll get that via logical replication. And then I need to tell it which user to use. So I'm going to do dash capital U Postgres, which is I'm actually logged in as the Postgres user anyway. Uh, then I need to tell it what database I'm using. And mine's called test database, unimaginatively. And then using the arrow to point it to wherever you want it to go to. So I'll just put it into the current directory, testdatabase.sql. So I run that. I mean, wow. <laughs> It's quick right and if you don't believe it's there if i just cat that test database.sql um you know there you are all of the, the sql statements so that was dead easy um and like i say if you're the kind of company who are, who is changing the schema over time maybe in a more automatic way or if lots of people update the schema then you're going to need some kind of way of saying to them don't make any more schema changes because i've taken the current schema and i'm going to apply it and I, I need it to be frozen for a bit um anyway once we're here all we need to do then is copy that file over obviously you can copy it however you want to but um scp tends to work okay for here so postgres at postgres 1 so this is postgres 11 that's postgres 1 um and I'm copying the file called testdatabase.sql and I'll just copy it to here. Um, and that was two mega second. Don't know uh, how big that is. Uh, oh, two mega, so it says 3K. Um, so I didn't expect it to be big. So testdatabase.sql, um, that's now ready locally. So all I need to do now is apply that schema onto the local database into this test database instance here and for that we just use psql the postgres command line tool so psql again what user am i using postgres which host is it well depending on what your permissions are set up as you might need to use the tcp address so that it doesn't use the unix pipe or if you don't put this, it will by default, it will use the Unix pipe. So I don't really know at the minute what mine's set up to do. So I'm just going to try this dash D test database. And then what file do I want? Well, we know what it is. It's test database SQL. So again, dead easy. All we literally doing is saying, oh, arrow doesn't work. Um, apply this file to this database is all we're really saying. And obviously we know the file contains a load of schema set up. So we do that and looks like it's okay. I mean, it is only a small database, so obviously that could take a bit longer, but if we now go back to these again and we refresh that, we can now see that we've got the schema for these. Now, if I actually query those, um, there should be nothing in them because I did schema only in the dump. So all we've done at this point is created the shape and importantly apart from having to enable the logical log, log level we haven't had to do anything terrible to the old server yet it's still running still serving our applications still doing exactly what it's supposed to do so all of this so far has been happening in parallel which is brilliant that's that de-risking process i'm not i didn't have to like unplug this one and then plug the new one in and hope it works these are running alongside each other 
it's all nice and kind of low risk so the next thing we need to do before we start logical replication we just need to remind ourselves of a couple of things now there is actually a page in um, in the Postgres docs about something called replica identity so if I open um, one of these tables here and get the properties of it you can see that it has a replica identity now what this relates to is if I send a logical operation across the wire to another database server how does it know which row to update now of course if you have a primary key and your update is related to the primary key which it very often would be there's no issue because by definition that primary key is an identity but of course not every table has a primary key or certainly not every table has a sort of a, a single identity column and if that is the case if you're doing anything strange where you don't have a primary key apply uh, applied to your table then you need to read up the docs on replica identity because you've got another number of different ways of specifying this to say my identity is a combination of these columns or, or you know whatever it is if you don't do that then when an update happens it will attempt to replicate it and it will fail go oh, i don't know what to update because i don't know what your identity is and like all failures in logical replication it doesn't make the database fall over or die or anything like that all that happens is the replication will go into an errored state and of course at that point then your lag between the data in the old and the data in the new is going to be increasing and increasing increasing so just i'm going to just going to mention that it, again it wasn't an issue for us all of our tables were quite kind of standard tables and they were fine the other thing is to remind you of what i mentioned earlier about large databases if you've got a, a database that's you know a couple of hundred gig then the potential hit in copying all of that in one go with a publication is significant and so therefore if you do have large tables and um, the guide that I read said something like uh, a large table is anything over I think they said 50 gig is that right yeah about 50 gig now our entire databases are probably less than six so that wasn't an issue for us but in a large database scenario you could easily have a table that's bigger than 50 gig and in that case they said that's the point where you should probably consider first or second of publication for that one table and syncing that across then you can get rid of the publication and create another one for another big table maybe you could group the tables together but eventually once all the large bits of copying have been done then you can create a new publication for all tables which then means yeah we'll keep all of the tables in sync but by creating an individual publication for each table initially that first bit of copying where you might be copying a, a table of you know millions and millions of rows doesn't all hit the database at the same time and potentially cause performance problems but once that's done the publication part is as easy as coming into the database here and again I'll do this in pg admin but you could do it on p sql sql whatever is psql um and just yeah create publication um create publication you give it a name you obviously call it whatever you want but um you know tend to maybe call it something fairly obvious so you know what it is and this is the bit where you can either say for all tables or you could say um you know for blah dot blah and name the tables individually uh, and I'm going to do that now you see it didn't really do very much because obviously there's nothing on the other end of this at the minute query return 36 milliseconds again I haven't broken anything I haven't switched anything off um, the application is all going to still work all that I've really done is created an endpoint for people to listen in to this database in order to achieve that replication so again all easy so far now this is the bit where you might have some fun and games and we might have some fun and games with uh, permissions and stuff like that so i am going to go back to this test database we now have the schema because we copied that earlier we're now ready to connect to that publication that we just created on the old primary from the new primary so in here instead of a publication we're going to create a subscription again we can call it whatever we want to call it let's just call it test database 
sub. Now, because we need to connect to uh, another server, we need to give it some kind of connection that it's going to be able to connect with. And at the minute, I'm not 100% sure which one of these is going to which of these is going to work and which ones aren't because they're obviously on different servers. Um, so I am going to go with the rep manager user and the reason is I've already got a rep manager user set up for creating replicas and stuff like that um, so if it doesn't work um, I can probably fairly easily make it work by updating pghba conf uh, db name so this is just a normal um, postgres connection string so host user port database name and then we tell it which publication we're talking about and we call that test database underscore pub now one thing I really like about um, Postgres SQL is if it can't um, if it doesn't work you tend to get nice error messages that kind of mean something so what it's kind of saying here is the user you're using I'm expecting you to give me a password and you didn't now rep manager doesn't have a password because the way it's normally set up it's um it's just set to trust the connection um so there's obviously something wrong in my um pghba conf which is the permissions file which we'll look at in a second but yeah rather than just going no connection failed which is what literally every single other thing i've ever used would you say yeah connection failed but god bless them at postgres they um they're helpful they might it, sometimes it even says there was no entry in pghba conf for this user and this database but the fact is no password means we did find an entry and that entry the first entry that matched this set of data requires a password and you didn't give me one so it's given giving us a lot of information there so let's go back to here um and we're just going to go into PG HBA. Oh, that wrong. PG HBA conf. Um, even all the blue stuff at the top, all the comments. So this is kind of what it's set up like at the minute. And again, I don't want to spend ages talking about how you configure PG HBA conf. It's certainly when people are new to it, they get really confused because they don't quite understand how it matches. But basically, it will go down this list, and as soon as it finds something that matches the type, the database, the user, and the address, it will require that method. And if that method isn't available, for example, this is a password one, if you don't give the password, it's not going to carry on down the list and try and find another matching rule. Once it finds a rule that matches, that's what it wants. And if you don't give it it will fail and that's why you always put the most specific rules at the top because you want the specific ones to hit first and the more general ones like these ones down here um, any remote connection um, to all databases for all users from any ipv6 address requires a password that's got to be right near the bottom so because I'm using Rep Manager, I don't really care too much about the security of this system, so you'd have to decide how you wanted to do it. I can look down and say, right, what's happening here is um, in terms of user and database. Now, these four rules here, these are all set up for Rep Manager, but if you notice here, the database that they're expecting is a connection to the Rep Manager database or a replication connection. And this is neither of those. This is actually trying to connect to an actual database. So what's it going to do? Well, it's not local. It's going to hit this rule here, which will be the first more blanket rule that covers all databases and all users in this IP subrange. And it wants a password. I mean, I'm giving it a password. So above that general rule down here, but below these ones, we say right host, which means it's a remote connection, not a local connection. Uh, the database, we could put all, we could put test database, depending on, if we're doing lots of databases, we could put all just to save ourselves some time. 
in our case we only have one database in Rimata. we'll be specific being specific is good for security reasons and then we'll put in our um, subnet for what I'm running here on VirtualBox. The alignment doesn't matter um, particularly, it's just white space necessary in between, but um, line them up a bit. And I'll just say trust, um, because trust is means I don't need a password. Again, not necessarily recommended, depending on how locked down your virtual network is, but for us right now, nice and easy. And then I need to, oops, sudo service, PostgreSQL, I only need to reload for those rules to be read in, which is nice. I don't need to restart, which means it's always available. And hopefully, when I run that thing again, created replication slot, create subscription, return successfully. Now, what does that mean other than something worked? If we look down here now, and if we now view this, we actually see all the data. So that subscription did a copy of both of the sets of data in these tables and is now also listening for any changes. So if you look down here oop, under my cursor, you'll see total rows 100 of 100. Um, actually, let me just make sure that I queried all of them. All rows, yeah, 100 rows. So we can just prove that the replication is working. It's always worth proving things. I always say this to people. I could just look at it and go, oh, wow, it's all done. It's all great. But is it? Is there something where it copied the data, but it's still not replicating properly? Question. Answer. Well, let's just add something. You wouldn't necessarily add it directly in here like I'm doing. You could add it through your software. Um, but if we just um, edit this and we just add a new row in, and that's company ID I think is set automatically so let's just do test company okay we'll save that data oh yeah it'll be 101 then presumably so it says oh yeah it did save yeah get it um so that's now saved so of course now the question is if I go back to this one and I view all the rows is it now 101? Yes, it is. So it's actually replicated that change I made in the old server across to the new one. And like I say, again, haven't turned anything off, haven't broken anything, no breaking changes. We're still pointing to the old cluster. All the apps are still working. But now all of the changes that we're making are getting replicated. So you see, we're actually 95% of the way through this process and we haven't even had to take any risks yet <laughs> because um, we're running this all in parallel. It's, it's amazing, really. So that subscription's been done. And then the last thing that we need to do before we're ready to switch over is about sequences. So I mentioned these before. Um, I've got it in one of these, uh, one of these windows already. I don't like the way um, when you kill off a a window it goes back to the first one not to the last one uh, right these are commands we run earlier right this is how you find out about sequences now fortunately for us we only have two tables so we're not going to have a lot of data here but when you run this select schema name and sequence name from pg sequences all sequences which are auto incrementing numbers in the database are listed here. So we have a company ID, which is set to one, and we have a contact ID, which is set to a thousand and one. So interestingly, one of the tables is using an auto increment sequence. The other one is using the one that I just tried to enter into and it gave me the error was because it's not auto incrementing the sequence. It just requires you to type in a unique number because it's a primary key. So you've actually got one of each um, already set up and those sequences are important. If we run this on our other database, our new one, you'll see that they're not set. Why? Because sequences don't get replicated. The numbers don't get replicated. And because we haven't inserted any data into our new database, because we don't want to, we want to keep replicating from the old one for the time being, these are set to null. So what we end up having to do for each of these, 
um, if I just copy that um, we need to alter because sequences are held as tables which is a bit weird name oh not name it's that one restart with um, and this is where it gets a bit confusing because that's supposed to be the last value but I'm not sure it is the last value I think it's the next one it will use I'm never quite sure so anyway you can set it to a thousand and two you could set it to two thousand if you wanted to be absolutely sure if you're getting loads and loads of traffic to your old site and you think in the time it takes me to do these couple of steps there's going to be another thousand rows added to that table we'll make that five thousand or whatever it's obviously you've got plenty of numbers to play with in an int but you know in our case we could set it to let's just set it to a thousand and ten so once we run that if we run the sequence again uh sorry run that again oh oh no yeah okay I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute um we'll do the same with this one and we will alter sequence uh, blah restart with and that was one so we're just going to restart with two now when we select this there's a, a strange thing with the way that sequences work in um, postgres where the view pg sequences doesn't always have the correct value which is a bit annoying because we've just literally set the new value and it hasn't worked and it's because we haven't made any inserts yet that hasn't been updated with the latest number now like i say sequences are tables so if i select star from for instance company id sequence you can see that it's actually set to two which is what we restarted it at so there is a number in there but that view um, doesn't work and it's a problem i've seen with sequences is you find different documentation about how to do them um, but that's only good for reading existing numbers if when you run it here you got null then you can take that null to mean one <laughs> and just set it to two or, or whatever but when I migrated one of my databases there were probably 30 of these um, and I copied them into something called nimble text which allows you to paste in a load of rows and then repeat the same text generation for each row so I actually generated a whole load of those um, restart statements just by copying rows from that pasting it in and taking those numbers and adding one to them so by doing that what you're doing is you're saying next time I insert something into the new database it's going to have an ID that's not going to conflict with the IDs already in the table so now you can see why I say that almost immediately you need to be ready to change over because if you don't change over now these sequences are going to be going up however slowly I mean some of them might not be going up but that one's obviously used quite a lot, 1,001. So that's going to be 1,002, 1,003. So that's going to start counting up. If you set your one to 1,010, then it might only be 30 seconds or a minute and you're already conflicting again. So either give yourself enough space in the sequence numbers to give yourself breathing room or just be ready to say, if, if I can't switch over because somebody just phoned me and blah, 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 blah then just do the process again run this again to get the latest numbers reseed the ones that you need to reseed and then at that point you've got two almost identical databases the sequences are going to be slightly different numbers that's the point at which we switch over we say right deploy my app with my new connection string which now points to this and not to this and of course like i say with all the planning and the prep and the testing you shouldn't have any surprises this has all been up and running you might or might not have already set up your monitoring and your backups and everything else but that's all that there is to it so you can see the actual code there aren't many steps to it but the kind of the planning is everything so before i finish you just want to mention um, another couple of uh, last bits that you'll then need to think about so i already talked about backups but you know again i've already set them up on here and you might have already set them up before switch over but you've got to think about backups i don't want to change over everything and then 
have a load of old backups that are useless because they, they're not version compatible anymore and then realize that my new backups are not working so again what i might want to do is to come into here and say actually i've just made some changes to postgres 11 let's just run a backup on it and make sure we're happy we got some stuff here because if i um list backups i can then get an idea right what have i got here i've got a 1.2 meg one which did on march 29th and then this one's waiting for wells because um there aren't any changes going into it um but is is this enough backups am i happy do i need to configure anything if i run um check are these all green or is there an issue um, there are a few funny little things with barman particularly when you first set up a backup that you might need to kind of think about but of course the other one is um what about regular backups um okay i don't have anything in cron tab which means my backups are not going to run regularly now obviously in a demo system that's fine in production you should probably have some you know whatever hourly 12 hourly daily whatever backups happening as well so things like that that you need to think of and again that's just all about things that would have been asked in planning hopefully what we're going to do with backups how many do we need at what point are we happy to delete the old ones etc etc and then next steps really we have um things like the replication testing uh, sorry replication and testing the replication so i've again already set up replication because it seemed it was easy enough for me to set that up in advance rather than afterwards but you might be setting this up afterwards and of course you might be adding more replicas once you've switched over um, after you've deleted some old ones maybe freeing up some vms whatever so again there's bits you need to do there it's not specifically related to the version upgrade but it's just something you're gonna have to think about uh, the monitoring setup so we use grafana for monitoring things or prometheus and grafana and the postgres replicas in our cluster all have a postgres sql explore uh, exporter on them for prometheus so again that has that been set up ha have you tested it um is it working are you monitoring things like disk space which again seems to sort of jump up and down quite strangely in postgres depending on what the logs um, are doing one of the things for in instance is uh, running the archive command on replicas to make sure they clean up logs because you're not going to use the logs once you've consumed them um, because you're a replica so don't just leave them hanging around so they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger so you run an archive command to tidy them up there's bits and bobs like that but the monitoring needs setting up um, and then deciding when to tear down the old cluster it's not really uh, again anything i can say much specifics about but don't be too nervous if this has been done in an automatic way and if the monitoring is going okay all well, the rest of it you don't need to run the old cluster for the next 10 years it's not like uh, after it's been going a couple of days you're probably unlikely to switch back to it anyway um, the thing that i did do on my old cluster for a for about two weeks is i deleted all the replicas off of it but i kept the primary and i shut it down and i shut it down so i could test that there wasn't anything else i'd forgotten so if something errored and said oh that server's gone down oh yeah i forgot to do that monitoring thing or whatever then i could find that out but also i had access to the old clusters configuration so that if something went a bit wrong and i thought well, that doesn't seem right i could go and look at the old cluster and say did i miss a setting did i miss a parameter obviously eventually what i did is i just copied the config down to my local machine and then i destroyed the, the thing but yeah i only kept it um i kept the cluster up for about a day or two and i deleted replicas and the, the primary all the rest of it but all of those things again the things you probably already know how to do it's just the more you plan it the more you automate it the more repeatable it is the next time you do it because next time 90 percent of the stuff you've already done because you've done it before so it should be easy so that's it really the conclusion is about you know the effort required here for a major upgrade is actually fairly low the documentation is a bit dry when you read it it looks like it's a bit tricky and you have to kind of teach yourself how to, how to use logical replication and stuff unfortunately that process isn't very well documented even though it is actually quite straightforward uh, but like i say most planning that you do can be reused next time all you need to do next time is go through and say are these things still true uh, and if they are great use the same scripts use the same playbooks whatever and like i say again most time planning infrastructure setup 
but all of that can be done async it can be done in parallel because you, you don't have to break the old cluster to create the new one when using blue green um, automation is going to save you a lot of time so it's definitely worth investing the time setting up and learning to use things like ansible puppet chef whichever you know um what's the other one HashiCore one is um those things just save you ages because rather than doing things manually especially if you're setting up four five six ten servers you don't want to be copying and pasting stuff all the time that's nonsense just get get your um automation to do it and really at the end of the day those blue green deployments they rock that's how you do upgrades with low risk and depending on your system possibly zero downtime but certainly not more than you know a couple of seconds of downtime as you're switching things over so hopefully that was helpful hopefully that's taken away some of your fears of doing this and fears of how complicated it might be it really isn't but just yeah have those planning things write stuff down give it a go test it in isolated environments um, do as much testing and stuff as you can beforehand so that when you get to the switch over not only is it dead easy but it's dead easy to fail back if something does go wrong so hope you enjoyed that any comments etc as usual please um, chuck them in the comments below otherwise i'll see you in whatever my next video is